I'm waiting. Shh. Lost my camera. <laughs> it's time for episode 59 of The Crisis Show, and Happy New Year to everyone around the world. Good evening. My name is Rich Klein. I'm president of Rich Klein Crisis Management and founder and host of The Crisis Show. And tonight is our debut episode of the new year, 2014, of course. And what we've done is put together really an all-star panel of crisis experts, uh, crisis management experts, social media experts, reputation experts, uh, workplace violence experts, and many of the guests you're going to meet tonight uh, wear multiple hats across those uh, areas. So can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Yep. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to introduce the panel now that I came back. Um, so, folks, uh, let me introduce our panel. Uh, and please raise your hand when I introduce you. Um, I'm going to work kind of uh, my left to right. Eric Bernstein of Bernstein Crisis Management. Please raise your hand. Nice to see you. And Eric is a rookie to our to the show, so welcome his debut appearance. Uh, next to me. Eric is. Uh, uh, Felix Nader, who works out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Long Island, New York, my hometown, a workplace security and workplace violence expert. How are you, Felix? Good, Rich. How are you? Good, thank you. Happy New to you. Thank you. And next to Felix is uh, from down under uh, Melbourne, I believe, and it is light out. We're jealous. It's, but we're more jealous because it's warm out there. Uh, Jane Jordan Meyer, author of the uh, Four Stages of Highly Effective Crisis Management. How are you, Jane? Hi there, and I'm actually um, more likely to be in New South Wales, uh, and I'm now in the Hunter Valley, which think of Napa meets Kentucky, i.e. horse and wine country. Okay, great. Nice to see you again as usual. And Thank you. And next to uh, Jane is uh, one of the top crisis management experts that, that I've known for many years, uh, Jonathan Bernstein, Bernstein Crisis Management, and... Founder of the new Wiener Awards, which we're going to talk to, talk about in a few minutes, out of uh, Sierra Madre, California. Nice to see you, Jonathan. And Good next, to see you, Rich. Jo next to Jonathan from Dublin, Ireland, our European correspondent and uh, somebody who just started her own Hangout on Air called the Hangout Pioneers, which I was a part of yesterday. Krishna Day, who is really herself a pioneer in social media around the world. Nice to see you, Krishna. Great to be here. And next to Krishna, we have from Fort Worth, Texas, uh, business continuity, emergency management, crisis management, he does it all, Mike McKenna of Fort Worth, Texas. How are you, Mike? All right, good to see you, Rich. Hello, everybody. Good to see you. And uh, another person who also has a very big following in the social media and technology world, uh, Shell Hulse out of uh, Concord, California, Hulse Communications and Technology. And the... One of the founders of For Media released the long-running uh, podcast in the public relations and communication industry. Hi, Shell. Good to be back with you. Good to see you. So I, uh, this is great, great, great panel to see you all, you guys. And we're going to start out tonight uh, for our viewers' benefit. We're going to talk about a lot of issues. And we're going to probably going to jump around a little bit because we have so much to talk about. Looking back on 2013, we want you to. Uh, get some lessons from some of the most high-profile crisis situations, and also look forward. And all of us are going to give you some tips on uh, how to prepare better for crisis management, emergency management, workplace violence, and online reputation. So we're going to try to do all that in the next hour. Uh, so bear with us. We're going to be doing a lot of talking about a lot of different subjects. But because this is the crisis show and because there is breaking news, we are going to today talk about... Uh, Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey, as our lead-in story. Uh, for those of you who may have been following the story, uh, just this afternoon there was a statement issued by Governor Chris Christie that uh, was an attempt to defend himself against something that's called Bridgegate. And what happened was a few months ago, one of his aides uh, decided to uh, do some political retribution against a local mayor in Fort Lee, New Jersey in that area and create a real traffic problem uh, in probably one of the most highly densely populated areas of the, of the United States. Uh, and I think maybe my friends in California may dispute that in terms of traffic, but we, the, the GW Bridge in that area is, is heavily traveled and a lot of traffic and it created a lot of problems and as someone who lives in the area, uh, my concern of course was safety. But anyway, um, I'm going to read you this statement 
that came out late today by Governor Chris Christie, uh, reacting to news reports that one of his aides uh, made this uh, happen. And here's what he says. Uh, what I've seen today for the first time is unacceptable. I am outraged and deeply saddened to learn that not only was I misled by a member of my staff, but this completely inappropriate and unsanctioned conduct was made without my knowledge. One thing is clear. This type of behavior is unacceptable, and I will not tolerate it because the people of New Jersey deserve better. This behavior is not representative of me or my administration in any way, and people will be held responsible for their actions, close quote. So uh, let's start with Jonathan on that, who is going to talk about the Win Awards in a few minutes. But Jonathan, what's your initial reaction to that statement? Well, it's, you know. it's good as long as he's just not practicing plausible denial, and in fact he knew about it. Uh, which is always possible in politics um, and as long as no smoking gun comes out a little bit later and shows that he was connected in some way so I mean he, he's uh, you know that everybody in the world both formally and informally are going to be trying to prove him to be a liar. Jane I know you wanted to add something to this so go ahead. Yes so I'm interested um, in what Jonathan said and I just wanted to um, as, uh, as a statement uh, it reads well, and I. But what I'm be very, very interested in is to actually have seen him say it, because as we know, body language is in, the non-verbal communication is vitally, critically important in a crisis. So whilst the words read well, um, I I would like to know how it actually came across in tone, how his eyes were, how his general demeanour were because we've really got milliseconds to prove ourselves. That's the first point. The second point I would like to make is that the words are uh, the first time that he'd heard about it, you know, and of course, as Jonathan said, people will be out to prove him wrong and to um, find out what the real skeletons in the cupboard are. So that, that may, you know, made without my knowledge, may come back to bite him. So let us hope that he actually is, you know, can put his hand on his heart and say, I actually never knew about this. So it will be interesting to see what the fallout is from this. And there are always unintended consequences. And it will be interesting to see what they might be. Sure. Good. Thank you for that. Uh, Shell, you want to add to that? Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think you nailed it in your introduction of the topic when you say, said he's defending himself. And that's exactly how he looks, is, is defensive. Uh, you know, there, there was an article in the New York Times on December 24th that looked at a history of, of political bullying. Uh, this is, um, in, you know, the revelations today have led to uh, a, a post on the WOG blog in the Washington Post that looks back over, you know, what they've defined as proclivity to, you know, retribution to, from political opponents. Uh, and he didn't address that context. He just addressed this one story that broke today. Uh, and I think that left him open uh, to being perceived as, as being defensive. Uh, he, he deflected to aides. It's their fault. It's not my fault. Doesn't the buck stop at the governor's office, at the governor's desk? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think he needed to do more to quiet this down than, than simply look defensive. And that's, you know, from my view, all he did. Yeah, I think they, they call it throwing someone under a bus. So <laughs> we've, we've heard that phrase in these circles before. And I think just uh, uh, before I turn to Eric on this, I know he wants to add something as well. But, uh, you know, my thinking on this is that, you're, you're, by the way, I agree with everything that all, that all of you have said. I think the reason we chose this as a story just for our viewers' benefit is that Governor Chris Christie is probably the leading contender for the Repo Republican Party nomination for president coming up in the United States. And, and because of that, that aura that has been around him, this is a bigger story than it normally would be for any sitting governor. I think we all could agree on that. It's because of what he's perceived to be in the future, and because he has been perceived as a as a contender, as they say. Or can't say like Marlon Brando, but you know, contender. <laughs> so Eric, pick up on that, please. I do want to add something. Uh, that just my immediate thought was that from what he's saying, heads are going to roll, and are they going to roll quietly, or are they going to just turn around and throw him right under the same bus they went under? Good point. Good point. Yeah. So, so with that, I want to. Uh, <clears throat> I think we. You know, we all, Anybody else want to add anything to that, Mike? Uh, 
Krishna, Felix, anything? Make sure I don't have a shot at this one. Um, so, I would, uh, hey, Rich, I, I would just add one thing that a lot of times we, we're in the response business, whether uh, any kind of response, and a lot of these things can be um, addressed from a prevention standpoint. And I'm not naive enough to think that there's not a lot of acrimony and um, political operatives and that sort of thing. But I tell you what, if we, if we hire a little bit better, then I think that we um, are less likely to see some of these people uh, make it to those high positions and making those poor choices. Great, great point. And I guess the, the, the questions will linger. I, I, think, uh, I think we could all agree as pundits here that this story is not going away very soon. There's going to be more uh, digging. And, and anybody, who gets, uh, anybody who gets more dirt, if you will, on this story, uh, is going to get a, a pretty pretty big readership and get interviewed a lot, uh, and we'll try to get them on the crisis show, of course. Uh, but certainly, this is a, a story that's just beginning. I believe this is uh, the beginning of more exposés, more more revelations that are going to come forward. Okay, with that, we're going to uh, shift gears, but not entirely. We're going to talk about uh, the Wiener Awards, and uh, this was a uh, a project started by uh, two of our guests uh, here, Jonathan Bernstein and. Uh, Eric Bernstein. So, guys, why don't you set that up for us? And while you're doing that, I am going to try to call up your press release uh, announcing the first annual Wiener Awards. And go ahead, pick it up, Jonathan. Well, I, I, Eric gets credit for the idea. He's been blogging all year about people who have basically been hoisted on their own petards in, in social media. And he said, you know, we ought to do some kind of special recognition of them. And then I thought, well, it's, it should be named after somebody who's really identified with that. And it didn't take very long from that point for me to say, aha, Anthony Weiner. And, uh, and there, we, uh, there we came up with it. And in fact, in this award, we gave Mr. Weiner the very first Lifetime Weiner Award wow. for not only being the namesake, but for hoisting himself in 2011 with his sexting and then doing it and, and derailing his congressional career and then derailing his mayoral run in New York, doing it again in 2013. So he was a double winner and uh, he got a special lifetime achievement award. And, but, you know, we really try to do this to, to educate through entertaining and, and hope to learn others learn from examples. And I think Eric can tell you about our top three uh, winners, uh, and you'll you'll understand uh, what what can be learned from them. Eric, you want to take it? But, but before you do that, Eric, I just want to make sure everyone can see the screen. Can you guys read this at all? Or is it too small? Yeah. Oh, there you go. I can see it. Okay. But walk us through this, Eric. Go ahead. Okay, so pretty much all of our winners, it just looks like was purely thoughtless use of social media. Really, any of these people with a second thought or a second opinion probably wouldn't have had an issue. Um, but let's go right into the winners. So number one, probably not a huge surprise, but Justine Sacco, the communications director for IAC, who sent her tweet, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. Yeah. Uh, oh my goodness. Unanimous winner. Every single judge scored that one high. It was just an outrageous mistake, and she was uncontactable in the air at the time and she landed without a job and pretty much hated by everybody. Hey Eric, can I interrupt you real quickly on that? Just as an aside, Certainly. this this was a, this just happened a few weeks ago if I remember correctly, right? Like the late December, right? Yes, yeah, she on. was one of our last nominees actually. She barely made it in the competition at all. It, and and, uh, and got the numbers up at the end and hit the home run, I guess. The other thing yeah. I wanted to ask both you and Jonathan on that is this reminds me, and this is my opinion, I wonder what you guys think. There was a guy who worked for FedEx who did something similar a few years ago. Do you guys remember that one? That sound familiar? Mm -hmm. He was traveling and he was he was criticizing his client. Yeah, I think he was actually Ketchup uh, Communications going Thank into you. FedEx. Uh, was the client. Yes, yeah. Yes. Oh. Similar tone, yeah. right? He yeah. was uh, making, a, making fun of the people who lived in a certain area or something like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, I'm going to add that link. Yeah, to that. Uh, we actually, yeah, we we actually had a couple that were kind of themed like that, you know, racist comments and so on. Just hers was just particularly given that she was allegedly a communications professional. That's what really got our judges set off. Is keep in mind, Eric and I did not pick the winners. We had five in five prestigious pundits and punsters as our uh, as our judges. We just screened the initial list down to ten so that they could pick it. So uh, they all thought, particularly 
since she was allegedly a PR professional, mm -hmm. she should have known a whole lot better. But Absolutely. Eric, Absolutely. you want to say yeah, what our second and third places yeah. are? Um, yeah, second place was Clorox. Did you guys catch this post on their Facebook page? Just absolutely, absolutely ripping the parenting abilities of dads. I didn't see that, but go ahead. No, Let I'm me give you a quote ahead. really fast. This is a direct quote from the post. Um, these are things dads do, according to Clorox. Forgetting weather gear, about 10 minutes into a cold, brisk, rain-soaked stroller walk, he might ask himself, why is this baby crying so much? Then he might notice the short-sleeved summer onesie little Peach is dressed in, and it might dawn him on him to bundle that baby. Wow. Uh, this had dads up in arms, especially the dad bloggers who are trying to rise to compete with the mom bloggers that are really a major presence on social media. Um, it's interesting to note that the male judges scored this at least a couple of points higher on average than the female judges, <laughs> but very high across the board. <laughs> And then we have number three, it was a tie between Greg Gottman, who's the head of Angel Hack in San Francisco, who essentially took to Facebook to trash anybody who wasn't whale healed and in the commerce areas of San Fran. Um, here's a, a choice quote from him. He said, the difference is in other cosmopolitan cities, the lower part of society keep to themselves. Oh my God. So a class act there. <laughs> and then we have Taylor Palmisano, who... Uh, she was a youngster just out of college, but she was actually advancing pretty quickly through Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin's um, his office, and she became his campaign finance director. And some old tweets of hers from when she was in college, which were basically just inexcusably racist, popped up and went publicized, and she probably ruined her own political career. Interesting. Now, I know that Jane and Christian want to jump in on uh, one or all of these. Uh, the, the, so go ahead. What do you guys want to add? Either one. Christian, you want to start? Yeah, I just want to say that um, I'm not sure if you're going to open up the awards to um, people internationally, but, you know, the U.S. does not have all the people who make mistakes <laughs> such as this. And I just want to put into the pot, I mean, one of the things that, that's happening um, still in Europe is that people are making um, faux pas such as that. So as an example, um, there was a case in um, the UK that was settled in about October of this year through the, through the courts because um, Sally Burko is the wife of a common speaker in the UK and she ended up um, ha basically paying um, a Tory peer, Lord McAlpine, you might have come across it, 15,000 sterling for damages for a libelous tweet that was posted. And the, po the tweet was posted when he shed about 56,000 followers. Um, it was posted after an event that took place. And basically, um, she was uh, making fun of the fact of why is Lord McAlpine trending. And the TV show had been all about um, the issue of allegations of sexual abuse. Now, he wasn't referenced um, in that, but she went to Twitter and put that post out there. And she is married to a common speaker, John Burko. And in fact, um, when it got taken to court, um, basically um, the McAlpine's lawyer, in fact, um, he actually you know, went after her basically and said, today is the closure of a piece of litigation which is now becoming a leading case um, in terms of internet responsibility. So in terms of the behaviors that we have and what we might say um, is now, um, got to the stage of actually people saying, okay, I'm going to sue you for this. And we've seen a number of examples of that. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Jane, I think you wanted to, to add something. Yeah, well. yeah. so I, I absolutely second um, what uh, Kristen was saying. Let's, let's have an international flavor to this as well because I can assure you down here in the Asia Pacific, there are a lot of clueless people as well. Um, so that's so I absolutely would say, yay, let's let's go for it, Krishna. You and I, I'm sure, can find contributors and, and help come up with some uh, some good uh, yeah, contenders for the Wiener Awards. Um, or we'll start our own. Uh, right. But in New Zealand, yes, what I've noticed, um, and I want to talk to it when I later in the program about the Today FM debacle with the prank call to the Royals, but um, in New Zealand, I've, uh, the Nokia uh, <laughs> people were getting very sick and tired of uh, the Nokia sales, you know, going down the down the tube, as it were, because of things called iPhones and Samsungs and Androids, and so certain employees 
just set out, and if you imagine Q Queen here, because they went F U. So that got retweeted a lot around uh, New Zealand in um, by by Nokia um, pundits and critics. I don't know if you came across that one, Shell, but um, in New Zealand they they had a had a fun time with uh, <laughs> sending up Nokia and Queen with F U. So that stuffs a little flavour there, and I've noticed a lot of f bombs around. I'm surprised. Um, just wanted to add one of the. Um, I'm surprised that the Epicurean. Um, there was also London Airport. Um, you know, they thought tragedy was fun, and they um, there was a post of a 205,000 crash, which included a six-year-old who died um, and they said, oh well, you know, we wouldn't do this to you and I quote here, London Luton Airport, because we're such a super airport, this is what we prevent from when it snows, Wee! exclamation mark and what they posted was a crash, of 2005 crash in yeah. the snow in which a six year old died, very poor taste. Yeah. So there's another one from London. Thank um, you. Epicurious, Epicurious with the Boston bombings. I thought that that was also terrible taste when they said, in honour of Boston and New England, may we suggest whole grain cranberry scones. Another one, Boston, our hearts are with you. Here's a bowl of breakfast energy we could all use to start the day. Again, very poor mm. toast. You know, yeah. I think a lot of brand. I think there's been a lot of brand jacking that's been mm -hmm. taken way too far, and and very very poor taste. And I'm certainly going to be talking about it in the next edition of my book, which will be out early 2015. By the way, everybody. Great, congratulations. So you want to add something about uh, Justine Sacco? Uh, Sacco, go ahead. Yeah, I think you know it's a cautionary tale. Uh, I've heard a couple of remarks about allegedly being a PR person, and yet Peter Shankman has noted that she's excellent at, at her job. There's a Forbes reporter who said she's a reporter's dream as a, as a PR person, uh, that she's a fierce... So, so is Lizzie Grubman, you know, I mean, I've heard this before, you know. <laughs> but you know, what, what this reporter for Forbes said, this was in a Huffington Post piece, uh, was that uh, over drinks a few weeks ago, the subject of Twitter came up, and he writes, although she's been using the service uh, for several years, Justine was still figuring out its nuances. One thing she'd noticed was that people seemed to like the tweets that were just a little bit risque or outrageous. And a lot has been made about the fact that she had only about 300 followers. So you could be fairly savvy uh, around public relations in a, in a traditional context uh, and still not understand these new tools. Uh, and, and that can get you in trouble and lead to perceptions that you're, you're absolutely no good at your job, which in this case apparently isn't true. In fact, Peter said, based on what she knows now, she'd probably be a great hire. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm I'm gonna chime in on that because I've been in this business for many years, and I and I hear what you're saying, Shell. What I'll say is this: there are people who are very good at pitching stories, but don't understand reputation, or don't understand crisis management, don't just don't just, don't understand, like you said, uh, how to use social media. I don't mean technologically. I mean how to write. Period. Uh, and this has been a big challenge in the public relations industry for years, where people come in who have great phone skills and they can pitch a story, but they don't understand the flip side of what they say and what they write, and that could be a danger zone for particularly people who aren't experienced. That's what I've seen. But uh, Jonathan, you want to add something about the awards as well, I think. Well, I just want to say unequivocally, we welcome nominees from all over the globe. We have a we have a global readership for our blogs and for our newsletter, and we invited uh, nominees. And Aussie Might, by the way, was one of our candidates. Uh, Aussie oh, Might. Yeah. So we yeah. we do take we do take others, and we certainly hope that next the 2014 awards, which have already got their first nominee, by the way, uh, will you know have hundreds of entries. We only started this contest in early December. That's when we came up with the idea. So it didn't have enough time to. Uh, unfold as much as we'd like, but I'm sure. send them on in to Eric E R I K at BernsteinCrisisManagement.com, and we'll start collecting them. That's great. As long as you give an exclusive to the Crisis Show next year, when you uh, this is the broadcast exclusive. <laughs> of <laughs> course, we wouldn't think of doing it otherwise. Yeah, and, and that is goal, unless John Stewart calls first. Of, 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 well, <laughs> you got to go where the money is, you know, of course. So. <laughs> but uh, I, I actually hope by that time. Uh, We'll have a broadcast that is representative of every continent. So we, today we got three continents. I'm pretty proud of that. So um, okay, great. So thank you both for so much for those Reno Awards.
for, for our viewers, we'll post the, uh, the the links to that that coverage that Jonathan and Eric uh, did. They have a Facebook page. I think it's called the Wien Awards with a very cool graphic, so you should check that out as well. And uh, I'm sure Jonathan and Eric would welcome your comments uh, about uh, their selections and people who you think uh, should be included in the future. Super. Okay, so I want to um, talk about a couple of things, more of like a, a big picture for the moment, and that is uh, for our, for the people here, uh, to, to the people here that are joining me on this panel. Uh, many of our shows in 2013 uh, dealt with some really uh, very sad moments, a lot of tragedies. Uh, it's going to list some of them that uh, our audience may be aware of. We had a typhoon in the Philippines. We had a nightclub fire in Brazil. Uh, we had an explosion in West Texas. We had a, a major tornado in Moore, Oklahoma. We had the uh, bombings in Boston Marathon. Uh, we had the, the disastrous fires in Australia and elsewhere. Um, lots, lots of horrible stories. And, and I want to uh, talk to Mike McKenna about some of these issues. And uh, Mike, you were on a lot of these shows with me. Yeah, Mike, you got to wake up now. Sorry, buddy. I'm good. I'm, good. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Uh, Mike, Mike, you did a lot of shows with me on emergency management, and we on the crisis show we've done a lot more in 2013 than we did in the prior year on these kinds of issues, and a lot of that was due to the fact that I had you as a guest a lot, and because of your really specialized knowledge. So, what, what in your view, looking back on some of these tragedies, what were some of the lessons learned? I know, that, and for our viewers' benefit, and also for our panel, Mike trains first responders in emergency management. Uh, disaster recovery and so forth. And so, Mike, maybe you could talk about some of your experiences past year. What are some of the broad lessons that uh, emergency management disaster response will have learned from some of these disasters, if any? Uh, thank you, Rich. The um, let me get a little sleep out of my eyes. Sorry. <laughs> okay. um, you know, it's uh, uh, the through disaster. We we can do one of two things. We can either um, you know sink into the depths of the despair and learn nothing, or we can uh, try to rise from the ashes and learn something. And so, from a from an instructional standpoint, each of those have provided great fodder uh, for the classroom and relevance. And I think it's the relevance that ties the notional aspect of the woulda, shoulda, coulda with the uh, the actual tactical and practical skills that are needed uh, to respond if that were to happen to um, you know in in your city or in your uh, jurisdiction and that sort of thing. So the so the relevance of having those responders. Um, and have the responses to, to kind of learn from has been helpful. Now, um, I, I remember Hurricane Ike, for example, and this goes back to 2008, but it was one of the largest and most expensive disasters in North America in, in terms of the, the size of response. Um, and that was a completely different response for a lot of people um, like myself from Texas that responded versus the, re the response that was just this over across the state line in Katrina in 2005. And for those of it that were at both of those, um, there's something very specific about um, the connection to your community. So when when I see things like Boston Strong, um, I'm from Texas, and so I, I, I've been to Boston, but there's there's not the same touchstone for someone watching as the people that are in that, uh, that are absorbing some of that, that energy and um, and vibe that comes out of those. So there there's a community resilience that comes out of these, to answer your question, and then there's the... Um, the tactical and practical resilience that comes out of uh, learning from those specific incidents. Um, the better responders, and I know we're going to wrap up later with what's coming next, but the better responders are the ones that are willing to kind of pull back that kimono a little bit and say, you know what, I didn't do this so good, how can I do better, and how can someone else learn from me and my mistakes so that we can um, uh, we can do better if, if a Boston were to happen in Sacramento or something. I appreciate that. Yeah, so... <clears throat> I want to. Um, yeah, is there anything else you want to add about some specifics in any of these incidents? I mean, there certainly were a lot of them that, that happened this past year. What, was there any of these incidents that I may have mentioned? And the only one I didn't mention uh, earlier was the the tragic fires in, in our. I think it was Prescott, Arizona, where we lost some firefighters out there. But w was there anything that uh, where something was really done wrong from from, a, from an operational standpoint, Mike? That Mm -hmm. That there was a big lesson that went out to all firefighters, let's say, all recovery people. Anything, any of these incidents had? Did any of them have a shining light on something like that? Um, that you could think of. You know, there may have, but I, I will tell you that I I don't filter those that same way. If there's any, I, very seldom do we find what I would consider to be malfeasance, where there's a, just an absolute 
uh, disregard. What we find, in my view anyway, is that on the scale from zero to 100 percent um, effectiveness in a solution, the 100 percent is absolutely unattainable, in my view. Um, so if we do nothing and we sit on our hands, we have zero percent solution. So one of the things that's so valuable to me about the viewers getting a chance to listen to all of the other co-panelists here that have so much depth of knowledge is that they will they can go from having a fifty percent solution for their particular crisis and and kind of suck the brains from the people that are here in order to have an eighty percent solution the next time something were to befall them or their organization. So I don't look at it in terms of um, of a failure. I look at it as um, you're a little bit off of 100 percent. What can we do to get you better the next time this were to happen? And I and so therefore, in closing, every single incident that we can talk about has the opportunity to improve the next time it were to happen. Right. Now, now, Jim, you were, you and I did a show with the Australian fires. Is there anything you want to add on this topic of you know emergency management? And also, the, for both of you, I want to ask about the uh, the communications component of first responders, like police, firefighters. And any of these instances, anything ju uh, jump out at you in watching these press conferences over the past year? Uh, things that weren't said right, wasn't said enough, or was said just right? I'll jump in quickly, Rich, and just make a couple of points. I just wanted to underscore something that Mike, with all his wisdom, I love listening to you, Mike. Um, we can either sink into the depths of despair or learn something. And thankfully, in Australia, um, tragically, but thankfully, we, we have learnt a lot of lessons from our Black Saturday, the tragic fires in Victoria, from memory, I think it was 2009, um, and where a lot of people stayed and tried to fight. So, you know, community resilience and all the lessons that were learnt after a major royal commission here in Australia, which is a federal government sanctioned inquiry, um, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of messaging that came out of that to the communities and bushfire preparation. We call bushfires wildfires for the uh, American audience. So, so what happened in Australia is that there was no loss of life, which is extraordinary when you think of the extent of the bushfires. Now, they were around the Blue Mountains, which is um, part of uh, a very major tourist. Uh, if you go south of Sydney, um, sort of southwest of Sydney, the Blue Mountains, huge acres and the uh, so there was major, major, major bushfires and they happened very, very, very fast. And this is where I think there are still some lessons to be learnt. Um, and that's, you know, there was a lot of despair just, um, shown, but again, people were philosophical about it. For example, I was personally touched by the fires that my business partner lost her home in the Blue Mountains. And she and her son was home alone. Her 18-year-old son was home alone. Now, they, she, he, they, she heard from her son about the bushfires. The alert from the actual official headquarters came about six hours after her home had burnt to the ground, six hours later. Now, so that's, that, that was an alert process that obviously went wrong, tragically wrong, and it was, but the community and text messaging and phone calls and, and mobiles played a huge part in terms of getting people out and people out and, and there not being any loss of life. So there was there's still a little bit of that we're not nearly at a hundred percent Mike in us in, in our our quick response. I'm not sure in the networks how that's all working. I haven't investigated it thoroughly enough yet. But there is still that initial uh, alerting going out. There's still reliance heavily on the community to inform each other, which they did and they did brilliantly. The community of the Blue Mountains also acted superbly well and came together and, and organised themselves at an evacuation centre, basically led by my business partner Susan Templeman, who is uh, has been a uh, has stood for Parliament in Australia, Federal Parliament. Um, she also organised, um, you know, a lot of places for people to go. She coordinated the efforts. She was the face of the mountains and handled all the international media as well. But it, it took a long while for the emergency service to totally get that act together. So we're not a hundred percent there yet. Maybe Mike, they need you to come over and do a bit of review review for them. Having said that. 
the mobilization of the firefighters around Australia was superb and the organization and the leadership of our our emergency communities um, with that bushfire was superbly done. From a spokesperson perspective, the communication was pretty close to flawless, I have to say, after some initial hiccups. Our um, ABC Think NPR were the emergency broadcaster and they de dedicated and put a huge resources behind it using every tool you can imagine, Shell, they used. Um, to pinpoint exactly where fires were happening exactly. So as a community, we were kept very, very, very well up to date thanks to huge resources thrown at it by the emergency <coughs> services with the help of the Australian Broadcasting Commission. Thanks, so there was a lot of very, very good things done. It's a good case study. Thank you. Yeah, I think some other people want to jump in on this. Uh, Felix, did you want to jump in on this subject or...? or yeah, I just yeah. wanted to. Uh, we want to get you in this conversation. Thank that's you. That's okay. I'm enjoying it. It's, it's, it's tremendously rewarding. You, you know, I uh, offer a, a holistic approach to uh, workplace violence that transcends all of the disciplines that I hear speaking tonight. And so, really, I consider myself a subordinate to everyone here. But it's fascinating that as we talk about um, emergencies and emergency responses, that everybody is reacting to the shooter, so to speak, or to the person that can perpetrate the greatest amount of, of harm. But there's very little coordination with respect to how do you communicate, how do you alert, and then how do you coordinate that effort with first responders. So I'm glad to see that while we shoot for perfection, that we still have a little ways to go, not in perfections, but a little ways to go in trying to continue the dialogue so that people understand that while the professionals have it all together, that the workplaces still have a long way to go in terms of really coming up with a simple way of conveying emergencies so that people don't laugh when they hear the fire bells go off and right. think it's just another fire drill. So I'm, I'm impressed and I, I can sit here all, that, all evening and just listen to you all. Well, we're going to come back to you in a couple of minutes when we talk about your specialty, but I, I think I had a couple more people who wanted to talk about this particular issue. And, and actually, um, I want to ask the question is, is about social media natural disasters. So I think... Um, Jonathan, you want to uh, make a point about business-to-business -business social media during natural disasters? Right. Uh, California oh, Pizza Kitchen has been a, a client of mine for some time, and they actually set up um, a password-protected blog for use um, during uh, during natural disasters because they've got a number of outlets along the Gulf Coast of the United States and, in fact, uh, implemented that, uh, you know, activated it a couple of times. Katrina being one of them, and and major storms uh, along the Texas coast being another, so that one store could talk to another with simple information like, you know, our freezers are down. Can you take our food? And uh, and and headquarters could monitor the blog and see what was going on in real time, but headquarters didn't have to get in the way. It allowed the the local shops to cooperate with each other and act as backup to each other. It was very effective use of. Uh, behind password protected uh, doors uh, blogs. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think, Mike, you wanted to uh, add something as well on the subject of social media and emergencies. Uh, absolutely. Let me start with telling you where the big problem is, where a lot of people get disconnected, and I, I assume most people are going to relate to this. Um, for, for the organized response, and I'll talk only to that part. So for an organized response, um, those are based on clear and achievable objectives. And those objectives are um, uh, established at the incident command post. So the incident command post is what is driving the operational objectives. That's the most important part to listen to this. From there, um, they're going to be sucking in as much information as they can to turn into usable intelligence to support those objectives and to frame those objectives. So that's part one. Now on the other end of that spectrum is social media. And social media is a lot of noise. And um, for those two dots to connect, there has to be a, an effective kind of curation of the of the information to turn into intelligence, so the incident, incident command post can frame their incident objectives and go out and do good for others. So just because someone po posts a tweet that uh, someone has fallen at, down at the corner of First and Main is not the same thing as an organized response to go out there and help the person at the corner of First and Main. And that disconnect, I don't think, is very clear to a lot of viewers. So hopefully. Uh, that will help a little bit. So now let's talk about how to tie those together. So there is, um, uh, and I, I'm not extremely well versed in it, and I haven't dealt with them yet, but I am familiar with an organization that is um, 
called, it's an acronym, V-O-S-T. Of course, every federal um, entity has to have an acronym. V-O-S-T stands for Virtual Operations Support Team. And those are volunteers that will mobilize in a social media environment uh, to curate um, the, the noise, the information, and turn them into um, operational objectives. Now, the, there are other groups, and CERT, C-E-R-T, which is very big in California, uh, Community yeah. Emergency Response Teams, uh, they're volunteers, and they're looking for, there's a little bit of mission creep there. They're, they're looking to get into the disaster game more than they already are, and that's one way they found to do it, is to start training up some of these teams um, to, again, curate that, that noise in order to drive those operational objectives. So now they're kind of going like this, but the next thing that happens, and it's happened a couple of ca cases where those uh, VOST members or the um, community emergency response folks, the social media folks, are now becoming embedded at the emergency command post. So now they can just turn their chair around um, or have direct access to the planning section in order to, um, to help fuel those operational objectives. That not only is something that we're going to see more in 2014, but that is um, the 2013 synopsis of why you didn't see more social media um, turned into uh, response action. Thank you for that, Mike. Very, very, very helpful. Uh, Christian, I think you want to add something on this topic, please. Yeah, just a couple of things that I've noticed, and one of the, one of the um, areas to consider is not only at a at a corporate level or an organization level, um, but also at an individual level. And I think very often we forget the people who are frontline, who are dealing with the emergencies. And an example I shared at a conference recently was something that was going on in the UK where at a, an organizational level there's a Europe uh, there's an environmental protection organization and they then are split across the country by a different region but they've actually then taken it a step further where individuals can actually be appointed as spokespeople for the organization and I think that humanizes it because when there's an emergency there's also a huge amount of emotion that goes on there and I think um, sometimes emergency response teams don't always come out um, in terms of being favored. It's always, particularly I'm thinking about things like floods um, that have been damaging people's homes here, here in Ireland and the UK. And in that particular case, um, it, you know, the, the fact that that person is a member of their team, but they're able to, with an official account, and they've been trained to use it, but they're sharing photographs, things like, this has been my home for the last five days, and they show the boot of the car. You know, I think that also helps in terms of that relationship. And the other thing I think is interesting is the use of new technologies. And I know that Shell's probably going to have something to say on this too. But for example, Twitter has introduced their um, Twitter alerts. I'm not seeing too many organizations yet um, having had them approved. But, you know, that's interesting that we're starting to see platforms say, we know people come to these platforms to get information. Um, and uh, actually I saw a police force um, not so long back actually testing out using Google Hangouts um, and I know one of the things that you talk about uh, Rich is about not just you know dealing with the emergency and the crisis but it's the preparation and so they were using Google Hangouts to connect to a community so I think it's really interesting to see some of the, the ways that uh, people are, are being um, you know, more connected to their to the communities through either personal teams or individuals in that organization or using some of these new platforms. Great, I appreciate that. Shell, did you want to add something? You know, you've been a long-time user of many technologies and social media. What's, what, what, what's your view on this? Well, my experience is that natural disasters has been one of the most um, natural uh, uh, kinds of a crisis for social media. I mean, the Red Cross figured it out very early. Uh, other relief agencies have. It's been a natural for people to get in touch with each other when other means of contact have broken down. It's been a great uh, way uh, for uh, agencies to advise people of what kind of resources are available. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that I've talked to people who work for utilities who use it during storms when power's out because people still have power in their phones and are able to get to Twitter and get to Facebook and, and find out when crews are going to be deployed and how long they can expect before their power is back. Uh, it, it, it just seems to be a, a, a great fit and I think it's one of the easier applications of, of digital technology for people to figure out. Thank you. Uh, Felix, you wanted to add something on this topic. 
Well, it's fascinating because as it relates to my specific responsibility, um, it, it, uh, it rises up other concerns that might interfere with emergency notification systems. So while the discussion might be favorable towards the use of social media, we should probably experiment a little bit on it from a higher communications level from the first responder perspective and see if we can get buy-in because what you don't want is individuals who receive an alert say there's something going awry in your workplace and it's not really official and then everybody responding like yelling fire in a movie theater. So it has great value. I just want to see it exercised a little bit higher and maybe situationalized just to make sure it can be interfaced effectively and efficiently. That's a great point. You know, I just want to add, I think that's one of the challenges that all of us on this panel you know, working with our clients have seen, whereby the person handling social media, whether it's the person who is the most proficient in, in how to use it or the person posting, is not necessarily somebody even close to the top of the food chain of a company or organization. That's been my experience. Right. And, so, and I think you, you make a great point, Felix. People at the top, they have to stop viewing social media as some game that you play and look at it as a, a, a very powerful communications tool. And Absolutely. so I'd like to maybe just hear what, what uh, some of the others think about that, that topic in terms of getting the top to buy in. I think you really got me thinking about that, Felix, so thank you. Well, there's, there's some data to suggest that the top is starting to buy in. Um, I can't remember the source of the study. Uh, I just wrote about it. Uh, in fact, in the issue of IABC's communication world that just came out. Uh, but what, what concerns me is, is this clarion call we've been hearing for the end to the idea of a social media manager in organizations as we move into an era of social business and everybody's using it. Uh, and it's just becoming a communication tool like the telephone. Uh, so therefore, we don't need anybody to coordinate this at a higher level. But, you know, it's precisely for instances like this. Uh, that I think that uh, kind of high-level coordination is required. And it's, it's good to see that more and more executives are starting to recognize that they need to take responsibility for how their organizations employ these tools. Yeah, I also think part of it's semantics. I, I think, Jonathan, you've mentioned this, and I have as well. Uh, the I, Just the word social media t t kind of detracts from the, the seriousness of which the, the tools are used, right? I mean, you, you've talked about that as well, so maybe you could just quickly... On that. Right. Well, I, I you know, I, I don't like social media and traditional media and all that kind of division. It's media. Right. Any way you get your message to your stakeholders is media. Yeah. That, yeah, but it, it, it's social media can be very unsocial. So it's not a good word for it. Great. Now, now Eric, you're you're one of the younger ones on the panel. Uh, what's been your experience in this world of growing up? You know, more in this world than the rest of us, I would say, um, and. and in the idea of your generation looking at social media versus traditional media and getting information in a crisis or otherwise? You know what, I think most people of my generation and absolutely of the generation coming right after are only looking at social media. They don't really care what it says on the New York Times. They don't really care what it says in Google News. They care what their friends are sharing on Twitter, on Instagram, and things like that. Um, I grew up a little bit differently since I was watching and listening to somebody who is in crisis management. But um, I think overall, a lot of people in my generation look at social media as the media. That is their evening news or whatever it would have been to people in previous generations. That's a great point. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. So uh, that's very good. Uh, this was a great topic. I'm going to just uh, shift gears a little bit. But I, anybody else, before we, I want to close the loop on this in a moment. Anybody else want to add anything on this, this topic of social media and emergency and crisis? Communications. Okay. Yes, I'll just um, add a quick, quick underscore to yeah, very quick to what yeah. Shell said. Um, in my research for the book, I've been talking with people and about you know social media uh, in terms of crisis communication planning. It still seems very much a tick the box. Oh, we'll just you know, if somebody looked, you know, it's like very dismissive. If somebody looked after social media, we'll tick the box. I think that, and I, we, there's a great need for a lot more uh, coordination and um, implementation. What's the key word I'm looking for? Where there's, you, you, they're not seen as separate, that they're brought together. So that's yet to really fully happen, in my opinion. Um, and that, that's very, very necessary, is to integrate. The word yeah. is integration. Right. 
Right. Well, thank you for that. So we're gonna we're gonna move on to a topic that really plays to one of our, our guests' real strengths, and that's Felix Nader, uh, who for many many years has specialized in workplace violence and workplace security. And the reason I really enjoy my dialogue online and off with Felix is that uh, one of my first public relations job was as a media relations manager at our labor and employment firm. So. I got my feet wet back in the 90s on, on a whole variety of workplace issues. And so when I talk to Felix, I get it. Uh, but I don't know that a lot of people out there uh, pay enough attention to the kind of things that Felix is every day on Twitter, on, on his blog, trying to get out there about preparation. And, and I'm going to lead in by saying that this country in the United States, we're having a dialogue about security after the, these multiple sh mass shootings. and. Um, there are many. Uh, there's a variety of, of a variety of, of uh, positions on whether you put guns in the schools or not after Sandy Hook. So, so Felix, I want you to uh, just want to look at the big picture first of all. Talk to us a little bit about Sandy Hook, about some of the things you saw that came out of that, and some of the things that you wish you saw that didn't come out of that, if you will. Great lead-in. Um, when it comes to my industry, I have a very, very opinionated perspective on it that deals with the Jane's topic of integration and collaboration. I think it's foolish for us to believe that we can train a workforce to respond to a violent offense, a violent offense or situation without giving that exposure to the employee on a continuous ongoing basis, just the way you do law enforcement who go to the range and shoot four times a year to maintain their skills. So from a higher level perspective, I think the position is centered on myths. People believe that it won't happen to me, it won't happen here. 9-11 was only a fluke in our imaginations and the country has done great in protecting us against any reoccurrence. So workplaces, um, hospitals, schools are all susceptible because the attitude is it may not happen. And when it does happen, the first responders will take the person out. Whereas my position has been hierarchical. A management commitment from the boards and C-suite that say we have to make an investment in people safety and security that not only talks about a good public relations and crisis management game but talks about situational awareness and procedures and rules that support people and what they do and decisions that they make so that when something does go wrong they know how to act and no one is placed in harm's way from a legal perspective for not having something so I think we're moving in the right directions. I just hate when the media jumps on something and makes a lot of suppositions and assumptions based upon Sandy Hook and running with the stories, as they often do. I think they ought to wait and let the professionals come back. And however um, they determine to report their findings, report their findings, and then go in and dig and uncover shenanigans that should have been reported otherwise. So all in all, I think from a workplace violence and workplace security, let's not forget that employees are not first responders are not emergency responders, are not people that drill in military and police tactics. They're, they're civilians who do never, ever, ever expect to have a gun in their faces or be to be challenged with someone who has a machete or a, or a hatchet coming at them. They're human beings that are far removed from that expectation and that anticipation, and they do not need to be told that they can respond to an active situation by distracting the person and then attacking the individual. I think we've got to be a little more practical in that approach. So I think from, from that conclusionary statement, we're going in the right direction, but we need to insist that our employers and workplaces give the workforce time to train if that's the focus they're going to go in so that they can be exposed to it more often and more frequently. So uh, Felix, thank you for that. that excellent, excellent points all along there. Um, would, would it be safe to say then, based on what I heard, that you'd be against arming teachers or principals with guns in, uh, in schools? So is well, that what I'm you well, you know, let me, let me just say something. Um, I, I don't want to, don't hold me uh, specifically accountable for the year, but there was a study done uh, relative to NYPD shootings back in the 80s. And you know how many shots it took a trained law enforcement officer to fire before they hit any spot on a human being? 18 shots. Wow. So if we're going to arm teachers and we're going to arm airline pilots, I would suggest to you that you understand the muscle memory factors that go, go in with pulling that gun, responding to a threat, 
and then deciding that you're going to make a calculated decision to pull the trigger when there's no innocent victims behind that person whom you may unintentionally hit. There's a lot that goes into this mindset. I don't disapprove with the notion of carrying guns. I just say approach it very, very judiciously and make sure that you make opportunities for these people to get as much training as possible in as realistic an environment as possible. Felix, I totally agree with what your last statement. Thank you. And Jonathan, I know you're a, uh, a shooter yourself, a gun owner, but also a crisis manager, so please chime in on this one. Well, my first career was in, as no, a military sir. cop and in military intelligence, so we did some training in this area, but Jonathan, there was recently, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, just hold on one sure, I know it's an oxymoron. No, I know it's an oxymoron, but, but there hold it was. But hold on. I'm sure Felix. Sorry? Jonathan, your, your, your video you and your me? audio are not synced, so I just want to just want to hold hold on for one second. I want to. We're losing you a little bit. I don't okay. know if anybody else experienced that. Can you hear me okay, Jonathan? Right. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, your mouth and audio are off. It may be just the broadband issues. I, my apology to our viewers. But if you could just start over, Jonathan, because I lost a little bit of what you said. All right. Um, I'm sure Felix is aware of this. There was actually a study done recently where they uh, tried to do a, a simulation with an armed teacher, but actually uh, using um, a light-emitting pistol. This was a teacher who was trained in how to use a handgun, but not trained as a law enforcement person. And they had a mock shooter come into the classroom, rush into the classroom, and the teacher tried to take him out. And what they showed was that actually what the teacher hit was about a dozen students and didn't hit the shooter. So, yeah. you know, to, uh, yeah. to Felix's point, it takes a whole lot more than, um, than just having a gun to be successful in, in stopping somebody. Absolutely. You know, one of the greatest advantages that I bring to the discussion is that by the luck of the drawer, I've, I've held a variety of different positions, including military, including law enforcement. And one of the key uh, drivers of my feelings towards not arming is I was a firearms instructor for several years. I was also a defense tactics instructor for several years. So I know how challenging it is when you just blow a silly whistle and put on the siren from a car and you watch how people's emotional adrenaline pumps to the point where there's confusion. So I say go into it very judiciously, very carefully, and if that's the decision that senior managers make, then be ready to look for the forensic guys on the other end who are going to be asking tough questions about due diligence and negligence and dereliction in, in training and uh, exposure to proper situational exercises to enhance those capabilities. Thank you, Phil. I think Mike wants to add something to something you said or something else. Go ahead, Mike. I think what I wanted to do is, uh, is just emphasize what Jonathan and Felix have been saying in, in, in the words of the people that have been following my blog and my post uh, for some time have probably gotten tired of me saying that we can only do what we are trained to do. And uh, essentially I'm summarizing what they have both said so eloquently. We can't expect someone to do something, whether it is driving a car, whether it is speaking to the media, whether it is uh, stopping a gunman, uh, whether it is teaching a class, unless they are trained to do it. And um, Anyway, I, I applaud both of those guys for saying that because uh, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the law of the land. We don't control yeah. that. We only do what we're trained to do. Yeah, I guess the question that retrained and retrained and retrains, as one of my mentors says. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, my sense, guys, is that there's a dialogue going on. Uh, whether people like like Felix, to your point, uh, could can people be trained to do that if necessary? I guess that's one of the conversations the NRA would like to have in this country uh, about training civilians to carry guns. That's their belief. But uh, as you two gentlemen just pointed out, three of you pointed out, that is not necessarily a good idea. Uh, let me give you let me give you a, a quick statistic. Sure. So a bad guy who has mal intended uh, intentions has his finger on the trigger. He raises the gun, half a second pulls the trigger, and whoever is the target is hit. But people who are not bad guys have to formally uh, announce themselves as law enforcement, and those that are not law enforcement probably the reaction time is a lot longer. So a law enforcement officer who says police don't move in response to someone with a gun takes two and a half seconds to do all that, reach for the gun in the holster, raise it up and pull the trigger. Half second is all it takes to pull the trigger and fire. Add that statistical data to people who are not trained in law enforcement and you'll see that that response increases and possibly pl placing others at risk or indecisive moments wherein when do I shoot, why do I shoot and what if I don't hit the right person? 
Good point. Sean, Sh I think you want to add something uh, to this conversation. Please do. Well, I really like the conciseness of Mike's statement that you can only do what you're trained to do, and that's why I think that you know, having a crisis plan is inadequate. If you don't drill it frequently, then you're not prepared to implement it. Absolutely. Uh, when I talk to my clients about crises, I tell them, you know, when, a, when, a, when an airline experiences a plane crash, it's a lot of awful things, but it's, it's not a crisis because they know exactly how to handle that. They prepare, they drill, they train. But when I talk about a crisis, it's something that you're not anticipating, and that's where leadership tends to hunker down and, and uh, do the knee-jerk thing uh, and uh, fail to uphold the values of the organization. Um, which is, you know, paramount in a crisis is that you're going to walk the talk that you've been you know, telling people all along. This is what we stand for, uh, and then to, you know, revert to bad old behaviors when a crisis hits because you don't know what to do uh, sends a, a, a terrible message. And it's only through drilling. It's only through going through the experience of here's an unexpected situation. How do we react to it in real time? That you're going to be able to react well when the real crisis hits. That's a great point. You know, I think it ties in nicely to what I said earlier, which is uh, when I was talking about the social media buy-in from the top, same thing here, whether we're talking about social media communications or real-world disaster uh, crisis communications and, and drilling, yes, you have to get the people at the top to, to lead by example. I think whenever we've seen uh, real disasters and we've seen the CEO out front physically uh, speaking about the tragedy and talking about the actions that he or she is going to take to resolve the situation, reaching out to families of victims. That's what we want to see, and that's what, where people like uh, all of us here on this panel, we say kudos to you. You've done a good job. You've, you've shown your humanity. And I think uh, that's part of the, the problem that I face with some clients. I think all of us probably do as well uh, in getting people at the very top to understand this, that they have to not just be a CEO to bring in revenue and get the stock price up, but really be lead by example when any kind of crisis situation hits. And it goes to what all of you were saying about buying in, uh, whether it's workplace violence or whether it's uh, social media or a, a drilling for a natural disaster or a man-made disaster. So all good points. I just want to kind of tie that part up. I think that's something we all could agree on. If anybody wants to chime in on that uh, as well. And also I wanted to ask Krishna and, and Jane, and living in two countries where you don't see them, we, we, we're talking a little bit about shootings, uh, mass shootings here in the U.S. Uh, Jane, you don't see a lot of that down under, and, and I don't imagine you see a lot of that in Ireland either, uh, Krishna, right? Well, in this down under, um, no, not a lot of mass shootings, thankfully, but what we do have is a lot of a lot of gang, there's a lot of gang behaviour happening in particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, um, bikey gangs, and also rival gangs um, with, with a, a lot of the um, new arrivals to Australia. They have brought their gangs with them and the Mafia is pretty alive and well here too. So we do see it, but luckily, thankfully, not on the scale in the United States. I just wanted to just quickly add um, just to, there is a lot of neuroscience out there and um, to back up everything that everybody's been saying today. Some of the world's leading psychiatrists and neurologists have a lot to say about the adrenaline brain, the fear brain, when it kicks in. Where it's in it shuts down lots of parts of our thinking and our brain, so we develop tunnel vision. And we will revert to type, i.e. to what we know. We'll forget how to speak. Uh, I, if we speak Chinese as our first language and English as our second language, we'll only be able to speak in Chinese. Now that, there is a lot more, there's a huge gap. Um, the military, the police and first responders, as everybody's been talking about, are very well trained and drilled and understand this. Where the big gap is, is in the corporate world. And there is not, an, there is insufficient understanding of how the brain works in a crisis. So at the front line, of course, and also for spokespeople who are not, if they're not trained and drilled in what to expect in a crisis when the heat is on them, they will literally forget what they've said unless their training is absolutely up to date and they've been rehearsed. So therefore, we'll see more and more Tony Haywards of this world. And we've had our own here in Australia down under. So I just wanted to add that to the to the discussion that there's a lot of fantastic neuroscience coming out and that corporations need to be 
fully aware of this, and it needs to be part of our drills, I think. Felix, did you want to pick up anything that Jane said? Uh, just sort of I, I tell you, J Jane um, is just stealing my thunder this evening with her observations and her insights. I, I think it's all about human re re nature, human response to situations. Um, I worked with a client recently where they wanted to take it right down to the basics and asked me to put together a violence response that incorporated um, the, their ability to support in the event of a disaster involving someone that goes postal, so to speak an active shooter and they were not interested in in what the person would do when the person came in with the gun they taught they challenged me with putting together that focused on prevention the violence response piece that dealt with the responsibility of managers and supervisors to deal with incidents that that could lead to escalation and then and only after they understood their responsibilities did we put together a desktop desktop simulation exercise followed by an actual physical situational exercise that placed employees after hearing the various alert notifications in a situation where they had to make decisions on their own and then take appropriate immediate protective measures. So I agree, Jane, that we must not assume, and I know that Mike has said this several times, we must not assume that just because you train twice a year that that employee or that person is going to get it. It has to be inculcated, and it's difficult in the corporate world, uh, in, in, a, in a reminding reinforcement way so that the person understands what they're supposed to do, either in concert or individually. Great point. Eric, point. So, Eric, you want to add something on this? Go ahead. Um, I think it just, this is a metaphor that we use on our blogs a lot, but you wouldn't go out and try to play sport of any kind without practicing. Nobody would walk on stage and try to perform a play without practicing. Uh, you wouldn't even do the company softball game without having some weekly practices, but for some reason, well, people don't exception. want to practice for, well, okay. <laughs> some are more competitive than others, but, <laughs> uh, you know, there's so many things that we wouldn't do without practicing, but these life and death situations, nobody wants to practice for. Well, let me be light for a second. So here's, here's a, a group of adults in a classroom setting, and they hear dummy Felix talk about warning signs that you should pay attention to. And here are some of the warning signs that should make you concerned. You have experienced a bad divorce. You have your child taken away from you in a family court dispute. Your wife and you are having disgruntled the relationship. You have difficulties paying your bills. You just lost a family member. Uh, you are distraught over a close, fr close friend you lost in a car accident. These are warning signs that lead to behavior that would be suspicious if the person consistently acted in a strange way. If you were sitting in that classroom hearing these nine signs, would you say, my goodness, they don't pertain to me, shut their presentation off and then start doodling? Yes, it has to be context and it has to be contextual. And oftentimes when we begin this discussion, we, we like to make light of these things, but they're awfully serious when it comes to individuals and their immediate concerns about their personal welfare, the welfare of their families, who's going to take care of my loved ones, who's going to feed my my dependent family member who is going to pick up my child from the babysitter. These are all the decisions that are going on through the minds of individuals who might be victimized at the moment. So while the training is all well and good, there are other family support issues that introduce confusion in the hearts and minds of these people. Yeah, that's a great point, folks. And what I want to ask you additionally just as we wrap up this issue is in your, in your dealings with clients, are you dealing with, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is this an issue that's relegated too much to human resources and not enough to top top management of the company beyond that that department, for example, in a big company? Um, or are you are you finding that CEOs and other executives in middle management are equally concerned about some of the issues you so uh, eloquently laid out tonight? In in all fairness, I think there is not a CEO in America, whether it's small, mid-sized, or large company, that doesn't go to sleep. Uh, every night thinking about that kind of a scenario. What do they do? How will they respond? And will their workforce be prepared to handle a situation like that? Here, here's my direct response to your question. HR is, is not police. Police is, na is not HR. This is an organizational commitment that requires an investment from the boards of directors who have oversight right down to the C-suite and their executives who have an investment and a commitment in ensuring that a program manager responsible for this entity of it is more focused in on educating and creating prevention as a driver and then properly training people to respond in the event that this event uh, happens in the future. Until there's a senior level commitment that understands the metrics, 
so that when the HR folks come in and they should once a quarter say these are the following incidents that have happened, these are the resolution remedies that are applied, these are the people that were terminated. This data is not being elevated to the C-suite so that they can be more intimately involved in saying, wow, we've got a unique problem. Let's not worry about the externals. Let's worry about the internal impact and start dealing with this from a a responsible and accountable perspective. No, what we oftentimes do is, what is everybody else doing? Well, stop worrying about what everybody else is doing and, and gather data relative to how your organization is doing with the problem. Great points. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to talk about this issue before we go into our next segment? Great. Felix, wonderful job on that. All of you, a very interesting discussion. Uh, and Felix, of course, we'll talk more about some of these issues as the year goes on when you're back on the show. So what I want to do now, folks, uh, is uh, start wrapping up this episode with some uh, tips and trends. Uh, so I'd like uh, each of our panelists to, uh, in the few minutes we have left, to maybe offer our audience um, a tip in crisis management or something that they've been thinking about uh, that's going to be a trend in 2014 in the area of crisis management or social media or reputation. It could be anything that you specialize in. So. Um, I'm not going to call anybody in particular. If anybody wants to volunteer, please jump in, and uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say. I'll start. Uh, you know, going back to our, our opening topic with Chris Christie, uh, in, in his reaction, in his response, what I never heard was, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, there were people who were stuck in, in traffic. There were emergency vehicles that didn't get through. Uh, and, and the guy never expressed any uh, regret that people were inconvenienced or, or worse if they were waiting for those emergency vehicles. Uh, I think that in a crisis, you know, you can't be afraid to apologize if you have something to be uh, sorry for. Yeah, the lawyers will tell you that an apology is an admission of guilt that can be used against you in, in court, but, uh, you know, where you're dealing with risk aversion <coughs> among your audience, uh, for them to know that, you, you regret that this happened uh, and, and that you're going to take steps to make sure it, ha it doesn't happen again, I think I, I think is important. Uh, I didn't hear it from Christy. Uh, we didn't hear it from Evan Spiegel uh, around the uh, the Snapchat hack uh, where there's, you know, again, uh, a sense of being put at risk with that data being exposed. Uh, I, I think a, a sincere, uh, heartfelt apology uh, can go a long way. That's been shown time and again. Dave Nealman uh, continues to be the best example I've ever seen uh, after the 2007 uh, freeze at, at Kennedy that JetBlue experienced. Um, yeah. And more recently, Melissa Harris Perry, I think her apology got more press than the original transgression. <laughs> Except on Fox News. <laughs> but yeah. you know, to, to your point, Shai, I just want to uh, just chime in for a second before anybody else goes in to uh, talk about that tip. You know, I'm also reminded of uh, the, the data theft uh, Target experience recently. It very uh, cold, not, no apology, just, you know, here's what you need to do. But there really wasn't a sincere apology for what happened. And I was very surprised at, at that company. A lot of people uh, took to social media to uh, express their outrage. And that was just, uh, uh, again, right in the, the, the Christmas shopping season, the holiday shopping season, uh, Target had to lose some reputation on that one, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, for, for our viewers, uh, Shell just wrote a really good blog about the apology. And we'll post that to our link. Uh, links to the show tomorrow. Uh, really great blog post. So thank you for reminding me of that show. Anybody else want to jump in with a tip or a, a prediction? Look into your crystal ball, 2014. Even though we're already here. I have I have a tip. If you're gonna if you're gonna invest in in workplace violence prevention, may I ask you, Mr. CEO, Mr. Board of Directors, invest in really good first line training for supervisors and managers. They should be your eyes and ears, and they should be the people responsible for reacting to employee complaints and also uh, on their own observations of at-risk situations. So invest in good supervisor-manager training. Excellent, excellent. Anyone else? Tip or trend? Prediction? I have one. Jonathan does, I think. Yeah, yes, Jonathan. The, the, uh, the overwhelming lesson from the nominees, uh, roughly 16 nominees we had for the uh, Wiener Awards is there is no such thing as private communication on, in social media. You think you're you know, a number of the nominees thought they were just sharing with friends, but you never know when one of your friends is going to take what you've written and 
share it somewhere else. So, and I think a whole lot of people still think that just having, you know, a reserved group of friends on Facebook, for example, means no one else will see it, and that's simply not true. That's a great point, John. I would just add that uh, an example that might be somebody who you direct message on Twitter, right? It's still social media. It still could be copied and pasted, much like an email and sent out. So. Uh, there's always a, there's always a digital trail, digital crumbs, I think they call them. So uh, yeah, so Jane, you you wanted to add something on your tip or trend? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think a trend um, is going to be uh, is is mobile, 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 and uh, also visual, visual, visual. We've seen the mobilization of websites. You look at what the um, old old school, if you like, the traditional media, I hate using that word too, but it's the only word I can think of right now, and what they're doing. I mean, the San Francisco Chronicle has just sent everybody to social media school. Hello. <laughs> I think that's amusing. But it, mobile, every, everything needs to be mobile, virtual, accessible. So in terms of organisations, your planning, I think my tip is, is and, and my trend is mobile. Everything needs to be mobile and virtual. Great points. I actually made the same point on a blog post today. I was, I was commenting on something I saw. So uh, we do think alike on that. Uh, Mike, you're next up with a tip or trend. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, two things. Two um, prediction. I hope that's allowed. Um, yeah, trend, prediction. Yeah, confusing okay. words. <laughs> I, think, um, I think stakeholder participation is going to increase this year. I think we're going to see more people seeing that these uh, ripped fibers within their organization of poor communication is uh, not helping, it's hurting. And I don't think it's going to be a landfall, but I think we're going to see um, maybe it's internal. Uh, maybe we see the evidence of it publicly. But I think there's going to be an increased amount of stakeholder participation, people, companies reaching out to, um, to us as customers, as um, board members, et cetera, and incre increasing and improving their, uh, their communication, probably because of folks like you that are advising them to do that. Number two, uh, my second and last, is... Um, again, another kind of a trite thing that I tend to go back to a lot is uh, uh, is the pendulum, and the pendulum represents um, something that's underserviced and something that is uh, overcooked. And where we want to be is right there in the center. And right now, we're seeing um, I think the pendulum of tolerance has gotten a little bit out of whack. And I think um, we we see when somebody makes a a human mistake um, that there is a um, a gargantuan re, uh, uh, response, and then with that gargantuan response, there's people that have another knee-jerk reaction. And I'm talking about things um, with um, um, uh, Paula Dean and recently with the the bearded fellow from uh, the Dynasty guy, right? Right. Yeah. And, it, and again, it's uh, it, I'm, my interest in that is more about the dynamic of action, reaction, reaction, and then bigger reaction. And what I see is that pendulum is starting to affect a lot of people in the wrong kind of way. So. Um, we saw a little bit about how the, the fans of, the, of that guy um, have then gone back and tried to push back a little bit against um, the network. And I think we're going to see um, a little bit of that, but I think we're still going to see that the consequences of people making um, mistakes to be much greater before the pendulum starts to come back and, and, we, and calmer minds prevail and start dealing with this on a little more reasonable basis. Thank you very much. Uh, great point. So, Krishna, you're next. Yeah, I just want to bring it back to the Wiener Awards and say I'm thankful for the fact that we've got awards like that. There was even a TV program recently here in Europe which was called the, the Twitter of the Year Award, so people who'd been really silly in terms of their use of Twitter. And I'm thankful for that because my, I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's a prediction, it's certainly a hope, it's an aspiration that I have, is that we, we continue to see those issues because then People might start, in, if they're in corporates or if they're in political positions or in a leadership role, they start to understand you know, their behavior, what they do um, in terms of their communications online also can affect so many people. And, and the fact that we can, you know, one piece of content can go rapidly around the world now, it's, it's, yeah, never, yeah. it's never been so easy. Um, and, and part of that is the fact of here, if I look at a European perspective, my real hope, and, and, and I couldn't predict the numbers, but I'm, my real hope is that people will really start to look much more around the integration of the platforms around communications, particularly around crisis, for preparation, for managing, and then the aftermath. 
And just as an example, it's around, for me, also it's around governance and it's around culture. And some recent uh, data coming out of, um, of, of a European review for Eurostat, their barometer, is less than 10, most of the, sorry, I should say, most of the 19 states, uh, sorry, 19 states of the European Union, let's get this right, 19 states of the European Union had only 10 percent of organizations having governance and policies in place specifically around digital communications and social media. That means that we're still at risk and so my hope is that we'll start to turn a corner on that. But Krishna, one quick question. Do you see uh, uh, among the European Union states, do you see issues about culture that may make this difficult because country to country you have a different approach to things? I think culture and I think also uh, legislation makes it different. So, um, just like in the U.S., you can't take one piece of uh, content and uh, or kind of one situation and and look at it being uniformly applied because you've got different regulations. You have the same um, in terms of uh, within that, and and also the adoption of technology. So I agree with what Jane was saying around um, mobile. Um, it's certainly here um, in a big way, uh, but it's obviously not necessarily at the same level in, in every market, in every country. Thank you. Thank you for that. Eric, go ahead. Um, I think that 2014 is going to be the year of the hack. I think we already saw just the tip of the iceberg in 2013. There were actually a lot of pretty big hacks where there was a big hubbub and then they just went away and nobody really cared. Uh, I think 2014 we're going to see a huge number of people impacted by this in major, major ways. Um, I'm absolutely positive there's already backdoors in huge numbers of companies and people are going to exploit them this year big time. So we're talking uh, Eric, we're uh, Snowden kind of hacks or intern people, uh, um, wrong employees, what are, you, what are you... I'm talking corporate, anything from corporate sabotage to data mining, certainly anything with money. Um, anybody who handles credit cards, money, any company related to that, all the way from the people who process it to the people who put in orders for big stores, uh, it's going to hit hard. It's going to hit mobile. It's going to hit social media. And it's going to be really ugly because I don't think really anybody is prepared. Yeah, great point. Felix, you want to jump in on that? Just quickly, Eric, uh, you're, you're a genius. You know, we talk about the violent offender. There's also an individual called the nonviolent offender, and that individual sabotages systems, injects viruses into operating systems, sends threatening correspondence, uses social media. So yeah, there is an opportunity for that nonviolent offender to exercise those uh, those behaviors to retaliate and show their vengeance in the workplace. Who knows? Yeah, great point. Okay, uh, I think we covered everybody. The tips. I want to just add mine. And wrap up the show. Um, Go with your audiences in a crisis. Uh, I've been in public relations for uh, almost 30 years now, and in the old days, it was always the press release. You put out a press release and a statement, and you either hand delivered it as we have, and some organizations I work for, or you would fax it out and hope they get it, and then call the reporter. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the, pre the, the press release being dead. I don't. I wouldn't say that it's dead, but I'll say this. Don't believe when you're in a crisis situation, it's good enough to put out a press release and put it up and you slap it up on your website and maybe call a few reporters and think you're out of the out of the crisis situation. You really today you must be, and I think you've heard it from all of our guests tonight. You have to be on social media. So what we do on this show every week when we are dealing with a break a news situation or analyzing a situation is one of the things I do and my guests do we go on Facebook and we go on Twitter in particular to see what's being said by that company or organization. And if they're invisible, if they're, if they're silent, it's my view there's something wrong with the workings of that organization in the 21st century. You must be there, even if it's just putting up a link, that a link to your press release on your website. It has to show up on Twitter, has to show up on Facebook. Uh, my colleagues know I, I talk about this over and over again. We all stand on pedestals and, and have our speech. That's mine. So. Uh, uh, I'll leave leave with that. Anybody else want to add anything before we start to wrap up? And by the way, uh, thank you all for staying extra half hours, and I really appreciate it. But anybody else want to chime in on anything I said or anybody else? Thanks for putting the panel together, Rich. Well done. <laughs>
My pleasure. Uh, this was really an honor, and, and, and thank you all for, for staying on. Uh, this was, for, for our viewers' benefit, as we start to wrap up, uh, the biggest uh, all-star team I've ever put together for The Crisis Show. It's taken me 18 months. Every one of you has been on the show except Eric, and Eric, of course, you're going to be back because if you're not, your dad's going to uh, let me hear about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but seriously, uh, you guys really know your stuff. I love the international perspective that people like Jane and Krishna have brought. We are going to do that more of that this year. We're going to try to hit every continent before 2014 is over. That's my hope and my prediction for the crisis show. Uh, so if there's anything that uh, you heard, and certainly as a viewer, you've heard a lot tonight, a lot of great stuff from all these experts, please use hashtag the crisis show. Let us know what you think, if you agree with us, disagree with us, uh, anything that, that came across that resonated with you, we'd love to hear, because that is how we build the show week after week, year after year. So thank you all for your participation. Uh, Eric in California, Felix in Carolina, Dave Down Under, Jonathan Sierra Madre, uh, Krishna, it's getting very late. I'm in Dublin. Thank you. Mike in Texas and Shell in Concord, California. You guys were wonderful as usual. I wish we had more time. As all of you would agree, we could talk about this stuff for hours. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out a little bit of time. But you will all be back and we'll do it again. Thank you so much for a great discussion. Uh, for your viewers out there, www.thecrisisshow.com. That's where you'll find this video and that's where you'll find our show notes, links to all our experts and some of their blog posts and so on. Uh, and tune in next week. Hopefully uh, uh, you'll be back, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Pacific, and the rest of the time zone. Sorry, guys, I can't remember all of you. But thanks again. Have a great night. Enjoy right, your Thank you, Rich. Thanks, Rich. Oh, all right. Thanks, Rich. All right, Ciao, everybody. Pleasure. Happy Ciao. New Year. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Ciao, okay. 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 okay.